Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to welcome you. We want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're blessed that you can be here with us. We're blessed that we can be together. Yes. We're blessed to be able to spend this time in the Word of God. We are blessed. We're blessed a lot. Yes. The Lord's very good at that. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes. And I enjoy being blessed. Amen. Having said that, I need to say this now. I am blessed far, far, far more than I deserve. Amen. His aren't amazing we, aren't, grace. Aren't we all? Yes. Aren't we all? All right. We, uh, in our, uh, we've just finished up recently our study in the Paul's first letter to, the, to Timothy, his son in the faith. Mm -hmm. And we'll be starting today going into the second letter that he wrote. Uh, but I, I wanted to say the purpose of our studies, you know, the reason we do this is not so you become a Bible scholar and go around and boast about how much you know in the Word. You know, it, it says that knowledge puffs up, right? Love builds up. But there is a purpose. I mean, there's a very distinct purpose in all the studies, and I've been saying this for many, 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 many years as I've been doing these. The purpose of all our studies can simply be stated because we've been given the word for encouragement to be Christ-like, which is love. Mm -hmm. That's and, it in a nutshell. Encouragement, because it says in Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. To be Christ-like, because it says in 2 Peter 1, 4, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. And of course, as Paul wrote to Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love. So that's it. Remember that. We're here to encourage you. Not just you, but to encourage ourselves. This is the word of God is encouraging to be Christ-like. We don't want which to, is love. We don't encourage each other by flattery, which no. the world does. We yes. encourage each other by the word. Right. Because flattery does not, no, it does not. strengthen and build up. No, it does not. It and sometimes up, the word up. breaks you down. Well, well the word it, does. if you need to be broken down. Well, the word is profitable for correction. Yeah. Right. That's, that's what that. Paul wrote to Timothy <clears throat> in, in this, this letter. letter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> So just by way of a little bit of introduction, as I said, uh, this is following the second letter, and it's probably following it by six or seven years, okay? Mm -hmm. That's how much time has elapsed between, between the first letter and this. It was written by Paul from imprisonment in Rome. Mm -hmm. It was written to Timothy, his beloved son in the faith. Um, it's generally believed that this was probably Paul's last letter and is very poignant in as much as he certainly seems to be anticipating mm -hmm. the end of his earthly yes. journey yes. and looking forward to his heavenly reward. That's what he says in chapter 4, right? Mm -hmm. But with that said, this is not about Paul, but about Paul's concern and love for Timothy, right? In his first letter, Paul's instruction to Timothy seemed focused on doctrine, the faith of the church, right? Mm -hmm. And the confession of the believers and the actions, the conduct of the church. Remember that Timothy was the pastor, the overseer of the church at Ephesus, which was certainly one of the most vital churches in the New Testament times. It's the first church of the seven churches that Jesus wrote letters to through the apostle John, right? So this Second letter is in many ways more personal than the first one was. More focused on Timothy himself mm -hmm. rather than on the church he served. Mm -hmm. It's more Paul's instruction to Timothy rather than his instruction to the church through Timothy. Mm -hmm. But that said too, remember, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Okay, so this is definitely written for our instruction. Okay, you ready to get into it? All right, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, 
by the will of God according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Paul is an apostle by the will of God. Yes. So once again, which is common with Paul, he is starting by noting his ministry, an apostle. It's not his, not his title. He doesn't have that mm-hmm. on the business card, but that's his ministry. And the fact that it had not come into being because it was what he wanted, but because it was the Lord's choice and the Lord's calling in his life. Right? That's important. After the great and glorious encounter on the road to Damascus, the Lord spoke to Ananias and in Damascus, he spoke to him in a vision about Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias expressed his concern about this infamous enemy of the church. Yes. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I think Ananias is saying, hey, God, you know, you know who we're talking about here, right? But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Acts 9, 15, and 16. That's how he starts this call in Paul's life, by calling him and showing him how much he must suffer. You see, that's both the calling and the cost. Right. They go together. They're supposed to go together. I don't know that's always the case now. But in this letter, Paul will tell Timothy to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He has to do that in in order to please God who has chosen him. This was the draft, not a volunteer army. We talk about the army of God. Mm -hmm. It's a draft, all right? Now, that that means something to me. I mean, you know, uh, I went in and I spent time in the U.S. Navy. I flew as a crewman in the Navy, air crewman in, in the U.S. Navy. I wasn't drafted, but the draft was taking place at the time. Mm-hmm. And this is just this is before Vietnam, right? right. Just before. Just before Vietnam. Uh, I was in just before the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Wow. That's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. But had I not gone in, and I, I did want to go in because I wanted to fly in the Navy, there was a draft going on. Mm-hmm. So you didn't, you know, it wasn't about choice. You went because you had to go. Your number was called. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Paul was the same way. He was drafted by God. But you know what? He was a willing draftee. And we need to be willing to serve God. He had a volunteer heart. He had a volunteer heart. Well said. All right. So Paul, he's saying he's an apostle of Christ by the will of God, but according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Not the promise of wealth or worldly respect. Not the promise of comfort and ease. Not the promise of a good job. The Lord had indeed told Paul the truth from the beginning. And as always, his word proves to be true. Yes. Speaking of those who, even in his time, were false apostles and deceitful workers who were disguised as servants of righteousness, Paul wrote, are they servants of Christ? I speak of it as of insane. I'm more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. He suffered for Christ. Mm -hmm. And yet, that was a life, a life lived abundantly. Right? It's a life where Paul would say, 
But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrant of Christ, a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. It's a promise of life. It's a promise of life that is lived. Remember what we ended with last week or last study, because it was about encouraging Timothy to take hold of that which is life indeed. You know, I mentioned the fact that uh, most people just exist. Yeah. They don't really live there. It was Thoreau that said the masses of men live lives lives of quiet desperation. As a matter of fact, that's what I preached about Sunday was hope, you know, having that hope that is only available from Christ, all right? That's life. Otherwise, you're just kind of occupying. You're just going through life. You're just taking up, that's a bad, you're just taking up space. (laughs) You got to live life. But Christ is life. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Without him inside of you, you're not going to have true life all right so let, let's go on i don't want to i don't want to spend too much time on it but please you know think about these things we had a dear brother who's going on to be with lord uh, uncle arthur burke and at, at the meetings that we had there he would often say the meeting doesn't start until the meeting ends because Arthur expected you to go and talk about what you had heard. Yeah, to meditate. Co- have co- conversations yeah. with the Lord about what you had heard and to meditate on him. And that's what you need to do, okay? Have a little talk with Jesus. Yeah. The word meditate, I believe, in the book of Psalms is like chewing the cud. And it's... Well, it's just to, to, to give talk to it in your brain. Right. Yeah. And it's yeah. mulling over what you've heard, and yeah. and when we go out to eat after a Bible study, we talk about what happened in the Bible study, and yeah. it's a lot freer at atmosphere, and you might get more out of it, or as much as you do in the Bible study itself. There's no time restraints mm-hmm. when we're at the restaurant. <laughs> yes. It's, it's true. I mean, you have, you, you're responsible for taking the word that, because God, the spirit of God will quicken something in the Bible study. In any Bible study we do, the the spirit of God should quicken something to you that's pertinent to you. And you need to take that and, and do it, meditate on it, talk to the Lord about it so that it absorbed into your spirit and becomes part of you. you. And you're right. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is the word of God. Feast on it. As the prophet Jeremiah said, who is called the wailing prophet for, well, he had a tough time. But you know what? He said, thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and the delight of my heart. I'll I'll tell you what, no matter what the outward circumstance is, when you eat that word of God, sweeter than honey, I promise you that that will become a delight to you, a joy and a delight. All right, the second verse, 2 Timothy 1, 2. Paul says to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. Timothy, my beloved son. Now, you know, Paul did not give life to Timothy, yeah. either either in the natural or in the, or in the spirit. But that right? was the kind of relationship they It was they Well, it was a relationship. Absolutely. Okay. I want to talk about fatherhood for a moment. All right. I, this is a, a quote from a book that was just, well, was written a little while ago. It was called, or a pamphlet, it was called The Fatherless America, Confronting Our Most Urgent Social Problem, written by uh, David Blankenhorn. The United States is rapidly becoming a fatherless society. Fatherlessness is the leading cause of declining child well-being, providing the impetus behind social problems such as crime, domestic violence, and adolescent pregnancy. One of the biggest problems 
And you know what? That's a number of years ago. It's worse today than it was then. So many kids grow up fatherless, even if they have a father. Right. Because he's too occupied. He doesn't To act the father, to be the father. So what is the role of a father? Well, I promise you this. You're certainly not going to find out by watching reality television or, Mm -hmm. or, you know, American television with its uh, uh, series and uh, they call them comedies. There's nothing nothing really funny funny about them, okay? Mm -hmm. So I doubt that while Timothy might have thought of Paul as a father figure, he would not have called him father. Right. Because the Word of God says, Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 9, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. All right? Mm-hmm. But that said now, think of Joseph in the life of Jesus, mm-hmm. neither natural or spiritual. Right. All right. right. Yet he was entrusted with the blessing of being the father of Jesus. Mm-hmm. All right? Only Abba is our true father. Okay? Right. So what's a, what's a father? Let me just start. What and I listen. I'm not talking about what they show on their television yeah. shows, or I'm talking about the reality because the Word of God is the reality. So let's think of the first and foremost commandment. Mm-hmm. That's what Jesus called it in Matthew 22, verses 37 and 8. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. It's Deuteronomy 6, four, uh, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. But let's continue on to the next two verses. Because there it continues to say, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. That's all the time. All the time. Father, you are responsible Amen. to, first of all, to receive the word of God for yourself, mm-hmm. then pass it on to your children. You shall teach God's words diligently to your sons, your children. Mm-hmm. That's not the job. Now listen to what I'm telling you. Listen carefully. That is not the job of the children's pastor yeah. or the Sunday school. It's not the job of the Christian school. And it is most assuredly not the job of the government school. Absolutely. Where most Christian parents ship their children off to every day to learn the ways of the world. This is serious. This is very serious stuff. This is, you know, this is not churchy stuff. This is life. Mm -hmm. And this is the word of God. And you better be prayerful about this if you are a parent. This is the instruction manual that God gave us. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. All right. Alice and I, we've started Christian schools. And I, well, I'll just say that. And uh, we have parents come to apply to enroll their children in in the school. Mm -hmm. And I would sit with the parents. And one of the things that I would say to them, that I considered the most important thing that I would say to them, is we're never going to ask you to support our ministry. I go into any kind of Christian ministry and, and hear them say, oh, we're not going to ask you to support our ministry. And I mean, typically, the response was, whoa, whoa what do you mean? We're not- a double take. Yeah, it's like a double take. I say because it's never going to be our ministry to bring up your children in the ways of the Lord. It's never going to be our, child, our job to train your children in the Word. It's your job. We are here to support your ministry because it's your responsibility. It is your ministry to raise your children. There are some things you can't pass off. Now, can you have help doing it? Absolutely. I mean, that was the purpose of the school was to be there to support the parents in in raising their children in a godly fashion. But we can't do it for them. You remember that? There's an old hymn. You got to walk that lonely valley. Nobody else can do it for you. In other words to that. <clears throat> I don't remember it. Okay, so that's that's what we tell them. We're just there to assist them in fulfilling their ministry. But it is your ministry. If you have children, 
It is your ministry. So fathers, with your wives, the wonderful, suitable helpmates that the Lord has given you as a gift, you are responsible. You are responsible to train them in the word, teaching them that God is their father. You are responsible to pray for and over them. You are responsible to bless them. And I'm not talking about once. You know what? You should do that every day before they walk out of that house. That's right. You're responsible to do that. You're responsible. You, Father, you are responsible to protect them as a shepherd protects a flock from the lions and the wolves. That's your responsibility. It's one thing to say, well, please, you know what? It's your responsibility. Speaking the word is speaking life into them. Life into them. Yeah. It's your responsibility to encourage them, shaping and forming them to become godly men and women. Yes. Now, it doesn't take much looking around to see that mm -hmm. we're not living in a society where young people are typically growing up as godly men and women, right? Your ministry, in short, is to love them. That's your, that's your ministry, that's your responsibility, is to love those children. These are the very things that Paul is doing here with Timothy. So that he might abide in the grace, mercy, and peace of God and Christ Jesus. That's what it says. Isn't that what a father should desire above all for his children? Absolutely. Okay, it's not worldly. These are the things, mm -hmm. that grace, mercy, and peace of God and Christ Jesus... That's the thing that you should most desire for your children. And you know what? You are the one that God has entrusted to see that that comes about. Mm -hmm. All right. Verses three and four. Paul says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. <clears throat> I serve with a clear conscience. You know, as I said, Paul had told Timothy in the beginning of his last letter, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. First Timothy 1.5. Conscience is defined in the dictionary as an inner sense of what is right or wrong in, in your conduct or your motives. Right? For a believer, that inner sense comes from the word of God that's been written on the tablets of your heart and from the spirit of truth that dwells within you. That's where that inner voice comes from. And you better be paying attention to it. And the world portrays that as a little angel sitting on one side. And, and the, yes, demon that's what the world, the they don't, as a rule, get much right. No. <laughs> okay. So, but that inner sense is the spirit of God speaking to you. And it'll be in that still small voice, like the one that Elijah heard when he was up on the mountain, right? In front of the cave. It wasn't thunder and lightning. It was a still small voice. God is speak God, I promise you, he has promised. The Lord has made a promise to lead yes. you and me and us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But it doesn't mean he's going to shout at you. He'll just say, here's what you're supposed to do. Because he expects us to be listening. And he expects us to obey. Absolutely. In Hebrew, the word for obey is the same as the word hear. All right? Shema. Shema. So, now think about this. Paul's talking about his clear conscience, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the same Paul who called himself the foremost, the chief of sinners. Right. And he says he had a clear conscience. He made no pretense about his imperfection, okay? Think about what he said in Philippians 3, verses 12 to 14. Not that I, he's talking about perfection. He says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind, I press on. Well, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You've got to press on. Okay? But he would certainly agree with John 
who wrote in his first letter, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. First John 1 John 1.8. But he would also know with absolute certainty, because John goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins mm -hmm. and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, it, clear conscience. If we repent, if we confess, if we don't hide our failures and our sin, we'll have a clear conscience. You know why? Because Jesus paid the price. Right? The wages of sin is death, but Jesus paid the wages of sin on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. He, God the Father, made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 We are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Is it any wonder that Paul would so joyfully be zealous for this, the truth that he would say to the church? He said, for I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. Why? Because it was at that crucifixion by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the, his death on the cross that we were washed clean from the stain of sin, given a clean conscience, right? It's finished. The debt was paid. It is the great gift of God that fulfills this prophecy. Isaiah 43, 3 and 4, I love this. Mm. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Mm. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other people in exchange for your life. Jesus is the one who was given in our place. That's right. And so then the Father says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 43, 25. And cast as far as the east is to the west. That's exactly, that's exactly what it says. I, wanna, I actually want to read that, okay? The Lord doesn't remember your sins when you have repented of them. That's amazing grace. Yes. So David sang with joy. Mm. And these are verses from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. The Lord, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You should have a clean and clear conscience. But remember, if you sin, repent. So Paul goes on in that verse and he says, I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. I want to close by asking you this question. Who do you pray for night and day as Paul does? We have a list. Well, we should be praying one for another. Mm -hmm. Not just when you go in someplace and there's a little prayer meeting. Think about Paul. He's doing this night and day. Okay? It, please, pray for us. Mm -hmm. We can pray for you. We can pray for you in general. If you have prayer requests, send them to us at Bible Talk. Mm -hmm. But we need, it, particularly in these days that Paul will call those perilous last days, we need to be praying one for another. Amen. And as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, pray without ceasing. So, Father, we just praise you and thank you, Lord, that we can come boldly before your throne. Lord, that we can approach you, that we can come with those prayers. And, Lord, just give us that heart of love, Lord God, where our concern, like your concern, is for our, the brothers and sisters, that we pray one for another. We just thank you, Lord God, that you have poured your love into our hearts. We praise you and thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Wow. Well, why not be back next week when we continue on in the study of 2 Timothy? God bless you and goodbye. Thank you. Praise the wonders.